Hey, so I'm uh, Christina Kinnett. I'm the Curator of Exhibitions and Collections at the Whaling Museum. And first of all, I want to also give a nod to Michael Lapides, who was really instrumental in making this whole thing happen um, and uh, making the connection. Uh, Michael is our Curator of Digital Initiatives. And, uh, and obviously he and I and Sarah Rose, who's our Curator of Education, will be playing a very um, in a group effort on finding the best way to interpret this material. Uh, so we have a very, I have a background uh, as a semester at sea child. My parents ran a semester at sea program for St. George's School. So this is something very near and dear to my heart as an art historian who's also fascinated with marine research. Uh, mine was sharks and turtles, but whales are also cool. Um, and, uh, and one of the big questions I think a lot of people have coming to the Whaling Museum is why the Whaling Museum is starting to tell this story in a more amplified manner about whale ecology. For me, personally, and James and I, I think, are in agreement on this, we have an incredible uh, historical repository of information from mostly the 19th century of whale book data that's been data mined already by NOAA um, and Judy Lund, um, who is here somewhere. Where's Judy? There she is. Um, uh, who's done a lot of work uh, on whale population studies, climate studies, uh, all kinds of different research has been done. Judy did a fantastic project um, a few years ago on whale population density studies based on data mining from our, whale, our whalers' logbooks. We have a very rich historical repository of data that is very relevant to current conservation policy making globally. And that's something that Michael and Layla will speak about a bit more in relationship to this question um, of the Watkins Shovel collection. And again, I just want to thank Joan so much for coming tonight. Joan uh, supported the donation of this collection to the museum, and we couldn't be more honored to have her here tonight. Um, I was mentioning to her earlier that uh, Layla shared the uh, transcript of Bill Watkins uh, from what year was that? 2000. And it is, if anyone wants to read it, I have a copy, and it's, he's, it was an extraordinary man, um, really brilliant, um, extraordinary person, and I'll let you speak about that further, but um, for us, we will now be uh, a resource for uh, research on comparative studies of audio material that will inform many important um, studies in the future to do with policy making uh, for shipping traffic lanes and for all other kinds of pollution studies, uh, noise pollution studies. So just quickly, I know you want to hear them more than you want to hear me anymore, but um, I just wanted to quickly thank our sponsor, Alan Smith of Alan Smith CPA, for supporting the Old Dartmouth Lyceum's lecture series. This is the last of that series. So uh, we can't do this without our community, so thank you very, very much for your support. We really appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank the Kendalls for being here because they were also instrumental. This is such a symbiotic, wonderful relationship where their research vessel, the Abel J, was used by Watkins for a lot of his research. Uh, the Kendall Museum merged with the Whaling Museum years ago. Uh, Michael Moore was a, is a former board member. Uh, we have all kinds of wonderful symbiotic things happening with this collection. So when you walk into the museum in the next year, there will be many more whale ecology exhibits on display um, already our beautiful whale skeletons are now lit in blue. Michael Moore was, did the necropsies on many of those skeletons. So again, this symbiotic, wonderful relationship. Uh, but we want people to feel empowered when they come to the museum of what can I do and why does this matter? Why does this history matter in what context? So that's the story that we're trying to fill. And this collection from Hui is um, incredibly important to telling that story. So we couldn't be more grateful for this donation from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. It's incredibly important to us and can't thank you enough for considering us um, as a repository for this fantastic um, historical data. So we're going to interpret this to the best of our ability. We're going to um, make this relevant and we are very excited to share it with you in the very near future. Um, so quickly, Layla, uh, is a research specialist in the biology department at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, she's worked on this collection extensively and she's going to talk quite a bit about um, how they will continue to partner with us um, in, in interpreting this material and digitizing it. And uh, Michael Moore, I don't know if he needs much introduction, he's such a um, friend of the museum, uh, but he's a senior research specialist in biology and director of the Marine Mammal Center at HUI, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, in case you don't get the acronym. Um, but I can't thank them enough for coming and doing this. Michael was working on this diligently last time we visited him at HUI. 
Um, but thank you so much. And also, please read the article about Michael that's out in the lobby. Or if you just go online and Google Boston Globe Michael Moore, you'll come across a fantastic article about him that's very informative of his work as well. So without further ado, because I've talked too long, <laughs> Layla and Michael. Um, Layla's, yeah, thank you. Good evening, and thank you all for coming. So. My name is Michael Moore. Um, the story really for me begins a conversation with Bill Watkins in about 2003 where he had a collection of tagging guns that he wanted to find a home for and he suggested that the New Bedford Whaling Museum could well be the place for them. So really the, the vanguard of this whole collection was that um, collection of material that was accessioned here 11 years ago. And at that time, talking with Bill, he obviously was very, very fond of this institution and saw it as a museum of quality with the ability to archive, contain, conserve, and interpret. And that's what museums do. Research institutions such as my own and, and Layla's tend to look forward, sort of a three-year funding cycle, and, and things tend to get forgotten in corners. And before that happened to this collection, um, Layla and myself, Peter Tyak and others, in fact, the whole sort of Hui um, directorate all agreed that this would be a good thing to do and, and Joan Watkins agreed as well. So, in fact, this, this conversation really became quite um, focused when Layla and I last May were on a boat uh, studying dolphins in Sarasota and I said to Layla, you know, this time, it's time we've got to work this out and I picked up the phone after I talked to Layla and I called James. I said, James, I've got this stuff, do you want it? And he said, yes. So <laughs> there we are. So through the slides here, what, my role here is to be the warm-up band for Layla and that's, that's a position I've hel held for a long time. We first, <laughs> we first met in the biochemistry graduate studies a huge lecture hall in MIT in, what was it, 1986, I think it was. I'll tell you a story about Layla. Her favorite number is 93. She always makes enough mistakes on her exams to get 93. Is this right? Well, not always. Not always. So 96, maybe? Was that, was, was, it was 93. Okay, fine. I, I, she knew I was going to tell that story, but I didn't tell her. But she knew I was going to tell her. So anyway. So Layla... Uh, studies dolphins and it's, I was always very jealous of her because she'd go down to Sarasota every year and she'd put tags on animals and she'd listen to clicks and whistles and all that stuff and I'd land up with dead stuff. This is, this is me on the right and she on the left and I was always very very jealous of Layla but anyway here we are what was it 28 years later and we're, um, we're doing a dog and pony which is great. So um, my role here is really to sort of set the scene and put Bill Watkins and Bill Cheville, because Bill Cheville was a scientist who hired Bill Watkins at Hui. Bill Cheville was a, also had a position at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. And so really, the thing that strikes me in looking at all this material is that the work they did was gigantic. It was huge. And it was really on a par with all of these people, some of which you'll know, some of which you won't. You've all heard about Aristotle and Linnaeus, probably. And, uh, well, those two certainly. But I'll talk about some of these people just to give you a sense of the quality and the, the real sort of significance of these people. But no talk at the Whaling Museum would really be complete without a quote from our friend Herman here. And you've probably already read it, so I'm not going to read it again. But just note that he really does sum it up quite nicely, the whole circle of the sciences. And that's what it's all about. All of these people were curious, they were intelligent, they were thoughtful, and they wrote down what they did they, in one way or another. Because without writing it down, it all gets lost and forgotten. So uh, these guys here are in the pantheon of giants. They really are. And this is a sperm whale, just so you know. So, a um, bit of background reading in case any of this sparks an interest. Uh, this gentleman, Graham Burnett, who is a historian of science from Princeton, I believe, published this a couple of years ago now, buy it electronically. It's too heavy to carry around. But it's a wonderful, wonderful, um, quirky, amusing, interesting, very in-depth 
analysis of his topic here, science and cetaceans in the 20th century. And um, I, I got a couple of quotes from that book, but it, if you haven't looked at it, there aren't many people who are going to read the whole thing. I did read it this summer while we were off on the boat, and it's, um, it's just a, it's a thriller, actually. I, but, uh, I guess that's kind of geeky, but anyway, it is. <laughs> so, we've got to start with Aristotle, because he actually figured it all out, and then everybody forgot all about it. So Aristotle uh, not only described the dolphin, this is in his written book, the His Historia Animalium, the dolphin with the air passage going through its back, the whale with the air passage in its forehead. He might have been talking about sperm whales, which indeed have that blowhole right at the front, but also baleen whales are, are further forward than the toothed companions, with the exception of the sperm whale. But then the, the next quote here, some mariners have actually heard the dolphin snoring. So I'd like to make the claim that um, Aristotle really is the father of marine mammal acoustics, unlike, um, you know, Bill and Bill were definitely made it, made it all happen in this century, but there they were, there's a snoring dolphin. So um, he also focused on some comparative anatomy, the mouse whale, Balenoptera musculus, the blue whale I imagine he was talking about, instead of teeth has hairs in its mouth resembling pig's bristles, which indeed it does. They're very, very comparable to pig's bristles. And last but not least, Dolphin, porpoise, and whale breasts supplied with milk. So we figured out the mammal thing as well. So the, note the date here. Now fast forward to the 1700s, and we have our gentleman Carl Linnaeus here. You know, Wikipedia is a wonderful thing for getting good portraits out of those remarkable qualities. So anyway, 1758, which was the um, tenth edition of his Systema Naturae, which is really the sort of the, the seminal work of setting modern biology on its feet in terms of classification of species and genus. It took him ten editions before he figured out that whales belonged among the mammals rather than the fish, which they were for the first nine editions. So um, Aristotle did pretty well, I think. Here is a nice little sketch from the summer house that Linnaeus had in Sweden. And presumably this sketch might have been part of his realization that they were mammals. He's got some nipples here and an umbilicus and a live young. So I'm not sure what this is over here. But anyway, I kind of love this sketch. Moving on, another giant was Baron Georges. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. He was French. Cuvier. And he was the father of vertebrate paleontology. He invented the idea of extinction, although extinction had obviously been going on for a long time, but never really understood the idea before. And also comparative anatomy. Cuvier's beaked whale was named after him, and he obviously was a giant in his own right. Moving over to these shores, um, Charles Scammon, I don't think he was any relationship to Herm Herman as far as I can tell, but they did live around the same time. They may have met in San Francisco. But he was a native of Pittston, Maine, he almost wiped out gray whales entirely, uh, not quite, uh, they're coming back, but he wrote, you know, then he became a naturalist with some, some sensitivities towards conservation as well, the marine mammals of the northwest coast of North America. And he interestingly sort of began to understand the impact of, of commercial whaling on sustainable hunts such as the, um, the native hunts, whaling and sealing on the west coast in, in Alaska and so on. So, um, interesting guy. Here's a sketch of a gray whale fetus that Scammon did. So now, um, another of my heroes here is Sir William Henry Flower, very British guy. He um, was a surgeon in the Crimean War, and he studied mammals, fashion in deformity, you know, what baleen did to people's backsides when they were wearing corsets and also museum management, so he belongs in this, in this story quite well, and for another reason which I'll show you in just a minute. Because, here's, here's um, Flowers' uh, illustrations of the skull of a sperm whale, and there's a sperm whale upstairs, as most of you probably know. And I'm going to sort of sidetrack a little bit, and you'll see why in just a minute. So here's the sperm whale that is now upstairs, that um, washed ashore, probably alive, in Great Point, Nantucket, back in 2002. And really this was um, one of the earliest steps in my sort of subtle ploy to get the museum to start paying attention to whale ecology. 
I called, called the, picked up the phone and called Anne Brangle and said, Anne, you said you wanted a whale. Were you serious? And she said, yes. I said, well, it's here. Come get it. <laughs> um, it took a little bit more sort of lubrication before that actually happened, but we worked it out, and that sperm whale arrived, and here it is. Here it is on its way, uh, D.N. Kelly's, late one Sunday night. best part of this story is that a state trooper followed this trail of oil coming out, and he thought a truck was spilling diesel fuel. He got to the dump and discovered that the whale was leaking. It wasn't diesel fuel at all. So we took the whale apart, and we found all kinds of interesting lesions in it. And um, here's my motley crew of um, whale biologists. They look like whalers, really, don't they? They seem quite happy, too. And so the point of Henry Flower and the sperm whale is to really give you a sense of the value of archive materials in museums. Because Henry Flower published in the Transactions of Zoological Society of London a paper about sperm whales, wherein he said, and I read, ossification, a special tendency to exuberant and irregular development, which really made me very happy because this is one of the ribs from that sperm whale, and we were worrying about why these sperm whale ribs were all kind of funky. So we went back and looked at a short four-meter calf whale, a juvenile whale, and an adult whale, the one we had here, and resulted in publishing a paper in Science about what we'd found there. And I'm not trying to blow the horn on this paper, but what I am trying to say is that this paper couldn't have been written if I hadn't been able to visit museums in Washington, New York, Boston, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and so on, looking at specimens that people had put on the shelf up to 100, 150 years ago. And my point is that museums are places where people put things away for reasons unknown, because those reasons don't become apparent until the curious person in the next generation or the generation after that come along and say, oh, well, here's a sperm whale. Let me ask it the question that I have. And certainly, when the collector or the curator accessioned that material, say, in the museum in Edinburgh in 1850, he had no idea that this joke called Michael Moore would come along to, to, you know, 200 years later, 100 years later, and say, ask new questions about it. So the, the real thing about a museum and its archive and its succession and its curation and its management is the unknown, the excitement. And this is so true of this collection of acoustic material that's coming here, is that Layla and I have no idea what the next generation will ask of this material. And that's the special thing about it, because well, the, the problem is how to pass out what to keep and what not to keep. But I, I know in my heart that keeping this material and keeping it well and carefully is very, very important. So, to sort of focus a little, a little bit more into the heritage of Bill and Bill, uh, we need to go back to the Museum of Comparative Zoology in, 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 in Cambridge here at Harvard. And really, this is a sort of a family tree of academic uh, folks. So, Glover, 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 how do you pronounce it? Michael, do you know anybody? Glover, Glover Allen, anyway. Um, died in eight, 1942. He was the author of The Whalebone Whales of New England, and he again was interested in worrying about extinction and vanishing mammals. And I found this um, history of mammalogy for this time period by these two guys, and Glover Allen begat Oliver Pearson, who worked in his lab, who in turn begat Barbara Lawrence Cheville, who married Bill Cheville. Johnson had another lab there, and he begat Remington Kellogg, who became the um, curator of marine mammals at the Smithsonian and was very critical to the management and early sort of establishment of the International Whaling Commission and whale conservation from commercial whaling. So the MCZ has got some really important pieces to this. And furthermore, as I'll show you in just a minute, Bill Cheville here was also working at the MCZ. So at this point, I'd like to sort of formally introduce the two heroes of this, of this evening, which is Bill Cheville on the left and Bill Watkins on the right. Cheville died in 94 and Watkins died in 2004. So, uh, quick bio for, for Cheville. He was a New Yorker. Um, and then he became very interested in invertebrate pale paleontology at the MCZ. So he was an invertebrate kind of guy. And he was particularly interested in, in fossil squid, 
but he also uh, classified, cataloged the vertebrate fossil collection. So he was largely a um, paleontologist by background, but um, at, during the Second World War, got very interested in the, the sounds that um, submarines were hearing underwater and recognized that they, they were marine mammals involved. And at the end of the Second World War, started to work at the NCZ and at Hui with that interest in mind. Bill Watkins, on the other hand, was born in French Guinea, West Africa. He arrived in the US at the age of 15, and they went back to work in West Africa. His parents were missionaries in, in West Africa. And he became the president of the West African Broadcasting Association. Uh, lots of linguistics and lots of uh, radio technology and electrical engineering. Came back to the US in 57, and he joined up with Bill Cheville in 58 at Hui. And before I hand this over to Layla, I just want to give you a couple of vignettes out of Graham Burnett's book about um, Cheville to really sort of set the scene for how these folks were interacting. So, and, I, and I'm trying to weave this, this spider's web of intellectual and sort of academic uh, relationships. So here is a guy called John Lilly. Uh, who is a behavioral neuroscientist, uh, did a fair amount of deprivation studies for the U.S. Department of Defense, and sensory deprivation, a strange guy. Um, but this, two, this is um, coming from Burnett's book. Burnett's thesis really is that the failure of whale conservation in the International Whaling Commission scenario there was really overridden not by the science, but by the popularization of the humpback whale songs by Roger Payne and also by Greenpeace. And my point here is that Scott McVeigh and Paul Spong were both uh, based in Lily's lab. So Lily, although he's been largely discredited because he was a crazy guy, um, <laughs> nonetheless um, created a very, very important uh, piece of the jigsaw. So now having set the same scene for Lily, um, I'd like to introduce a relationship between Cheville and Lily. So in this book by Burnett, uh, there's this uh, letter that was in Lily's archives. Um, I'll let you read it, but basically, uh, Cheville's got this wonderful dry humor. And um, he also apparently had a fairly common way of signing off, which Graham felt was... Um, sort of appropriate in terms of how uh, he was relating to uh, Lily. But uh, Lily was doing a fair amount of experimental work on, on dolphins, neurophysiology and electrodes in live animals, and there's a fair amount of LSD involved as well. <laughs> Which well, there was back then, because they didn't know what they were dealing with. But anyway, um, really the sort of the summation of this book of Burnett's is at the sort of first international symposium in cetacean research. And Lily had published a paper prior to that about distress signals in, in dolphins here. And this is a story actually related to, to the author of the book by a colleague of ours, uh, Sam Ridgway, who's still, still alive, still working in, in the West Coast in San Diego in the Navy dolphin lab there. Cheville pipes up from the back of the room. Well, John certainly has the most distressed dolphins in the world. So, the, you know, just the, the dryness of his humor there is, is lovely. So, um, and, you know, then Graham sort of goes on to sort of poke, poke fun at the whole scenario there. So, with that, I will hand over the legacy to Layla. So, okay, so I am going to pick up uh, where Michael left off and really focus in now on um, Bill Cheville and Bill Watkins, who are the source of the materials that are being acquired by um, the museum. And um, I'm actually going to be telling their story a lot through their own voices via um, some clips, audio and video clips that I have from both of them. So I was trying to use that as much as possible since I think they can tell their story better than I can. But I did want to mention that I had the incredible good fortune and privilege to actually have um, interacted with both of 
the Bills in my own career, and um, I feel that they both really greatly influenced my own um, development as a marine mammal bioacoustician. And so um, I'll start out just by mentioning that, um, sh to build from what Michael was just talking about, that Cheville and Watkins' work was really the antithesis of Lily's. Um, rather than the kind of sensational, very, you know, sort of uh, kind of crazy stuff that Michael mentioned, and also very goal-driven work that Lily was doing. He was absolutely convinced that dolphins had language and was going to hell-bent on fi finding proof for that. Um, their, their approach was really opposite of that, very, very careful, very methodical, very data-driven. And so that was really how their work proceeded and what set just such an incredibly strong foundation for the field of marine mammal bio bioacoustics that exists today. So I'll start with a little bit of background about Cheville. Um, his interest in, um, he will, I should start, he, he started working on marine mammal bioacoustics with his wife, Barbara Lawrence, as um, Michael mentioned, about 10 years before Watkins came into the picture. And their work began in the 1940s with the first scientific paper ever published about marine mammal so sounds coming out in 1949. So that's what I'm showing up here. And this was about the beluga whale, which they had recorded in Canada. And um, just thought I would mention as an aside while I have this up here that um, they, uh, you'll frequently see the word porpoise used. It was kind of used interchangeably with the word dolphin at that time. And it was not until later that the terms came to represent different taxonomic groups, which they actually are. Um, so you might see that term a lot, but just it's kind of a historical artifact. Um, but so um, I'm going to play for you actually a clip from these original recordings with an introduction by Cheville, so you can actually hear him speaking in this one. Oh, I have to turn this one down a little. A small Arctic whale, Delphinopterus lucas, the beluga or white whale, has for centuries been known as an undersea talker and was called sea canary by old-time Arctic sailors. Several years ago, in July 1949, we made this recording in the Saguenay River, Quebec, as a small group of 10 or 15 swam shouting beneath our boat. I think that goes on for a while, so I'll probably... So you get the picture, <laughs> sea canaries. Um, and Cheville and Lawrence's work also provided the first demonstration of a cetacean's ability to echolocate in a paper published in 1956. And this groundbreaking work set the stage for decades of research um, into cetacean echolocation abilities that continues today. So um, this was really, really seminal work. Now, shortly after that study, Cheville recognized the need for someone with more technical skills for recording cetaceans at sea, and that began then the almost four-decade-long association that he had with Bill Watkins. And um, so he, what follows here is the first of several segments that I'll play from that oral history of Bill Watkins that Christina mentioned. And I just thought, again, better to hear it um, actually coming from him. And so. Um, I'll just go ahead and play the first one here, if I can get my mouse to work. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, oh no. Sorry. What's going on here? This did work. We tested it, so. Okay. There we go. Oh. speaks very well about their relationship. And that was then, you know, set the stage for the development of a lot of really important technologies that pretty much revolutionized the field, um, starting with the Watkins rowboat recorder, which is shown here, a picture of Bill holding his portable recorder that was able to take out on a small boat and was weatherproof, more or less. Um, 
And uh, so this is a photo from some time in the, in the 1960s. He also designed seaworthy amplifiers. He can, shown here working on some of these on uh, one of the research vessels. And he also developed the first hydrophones conducive to rapid deployment. Um, and this is a pic photo, this is a later photo, um, a more, more recent photo of him deploying the hydrophones at sea. He's actually on board the, I believe, the Able J on, in this, if not the Ida Z, one of those two vessels that he chartered from the Kendalls um, and um, was actually, were actually vessels designed for marine mammal research, so nice quiet engines. And um, so here's just another clip uh, where Bill talks about the development of these hydrophones. Hydrophones, I remember growing in short salt crystal and actually cutting them to, to proper shapes and putting them in boots with, uh, with, with fine castor oil. Uh, there were some companies that were putting out, uh, putting out hydrophones and geophysical hydrophones of the time, if you remember, where they were huge things. Uh, large and round and very heavy because they were filled with oil, uh, with quite inflexible cables and so forth, none of which lent themselves to working with, with animals on or deploying rapidly. And you go out to work with animals while they're, they're close for a short time, and then as they move on, you have to put yourself in front of them in order to get the next observation. So um, the next step after developing these hydrophones was the development of a hydrophone array for localization of sounds. Um, and in 1972, Cheville and Watkins published this paper on um, the sound source localization using arrival time differences on a three-dimensional three hydrophone array. And this is, again, a, a later photo of Bill um, showing him monitoring the shipboard side of this array. And um, this was really groundbreaking work, again, as much of their work it was. Um, one of the issues here is that cetaceans don't make any visible movements associated with making sounds. So this is one of the most intractable issues that those of us who study cetacean communication have to deal with, is that you can't look at a whale or a dolphin and, and tell that it's vocalizing the way you can look at me, for example, and tell that I'm vocalizing. So um, you can put a hydrophone in a water with a bunch of whales, and even if you can actually see them, you still don't know which ones may be making the sounds. So, um, so it's really difficult to make any significant inroads into understanding how they're communicating with one another if you don't know which individuals are actually making which sounds. So this technological advance really revolutionized the field of marine mammal bioacoustics still being used. So much of the early work that Cheville and Watkins did in the late 50s and early 60s was exploratory in nature. And here's um, just another clip from Watkins oral history describing this. Whoops, oops, getting ahead of myself here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, what is going on? I think I'm pushing this too, too hard. Okay. I'm going to try this again. Okay. There we go. Well, I joined in January 1958. He started looking at animal sounds. 10 years previous. There were a few things that we knew. We knew that, that several species made sounds on the water. We didn't know very many of them. A lot of the first cruises that I had with Gosheville, we had no idea what the species were we were looking at. Uh, we would, in fact, have to actually catch a specimen of, uh, of the dolphins and porpoises that we were working with and bring it home clean down the bones, send the bones up to Harvard's MCZ, and go to the call me up and say, put this name down next to that, that, uh, that site. Uh, that was the state of the minority at that time. We were almost, it was pining in every way. And this uh, right here is actually the, one of the harpoons that they actually used <laughs> to collect specimens for, um, that was, Michael just handed over to the museum uh, last week, so um, just part of the collection there. It's kind of a 
brutal aspect of how that work was carried out, but again, that was just the state of things then. I mean, they literally just did not know what, what they were listening to. So um, that, was, that was really how, how things got started. So some of the earliest recordings of these really pioneering recordings were compiled onto an LP um, back in 1962 that was produced by the Woods Hole Oceanographic called Whale and Porpoise Voices. And this is actually the um, CD reproduction of that LP, which is actually still sold in the Hui Exhibit Center. Um, but, uh, and this is just the insert from that. And I'd like to actually play for you now the introduction from that CD, which is in, um, Bill, narrated by Bill Cheville. These records are part of a study of the biology of living cetaceans at sea carried out at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution by W. E. Cheville with the acoustic assistance of W. A. Watkins. The cetaceans, whales and porpoises, contribute more than any other animals to the natural biological sounds of the sea. Hardly any of this is audible to the seafarer unless he has underwater listening equipment. Even then, there remains the considerable difficulty of identifying the kind of whale being heard as very little or nothing of the animal may be seen from the ship. The sounds here presented are true vocal phonation and not noises incidental to swimming or other activities. The whales get along quite well without vocal cords. Of the hundred odd species of cetaceans, perhaps 20 have been identifiably recorded. We present here samples of the sounds of 18 which we have identified in a few cases by capture. Except for the Inia, which were captive, the animals heard here were at large in their native sea. For this reason, water and ship noises are sometimes audible. These are often pitched quite low. All of these sounds were heard underwater. Some details of the recording equipment and its frequency range are given in the accompanying notes. The whales are divided into two suborders. The odontocetes with teeth and the mysticetes without teeth and with baleen. You will note that the odontocetes sounds include impulsive clicks at rates up to a few hundred in a second. These clicks are evidently used in echolocation, like active sonar, while the squeals. appear to be primarily communicative, although the frequency shift in some of the squeals is suggestive of possible navigational use. We know even less about the utilization of the quite different moans and screams of the mysticetes. We use the animals' technical names throughout, but also give English vernacular names whenever we know widely understood ones. We begin with the odontocetes. Okay, and so I actually did also include a couple of um, sections from Whale and Porpoise Voices, one mysticete and one adonisete, so I'll go ahead and play those. The mysticetes, or baleen whales, represented by no more than a dozen species, inhabit all oceans. They seem to be much less loquacious than the odonisetes, but further fieldwork may modify this opinion. The next selection was recorded in April, within half a mile of the beach at Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, and is the voice of Eubelina Glacialis, the right whale, on which the whaling industry was founded, and which is now far from numerous. So it goes on for a while, so I'll uh, stop it there. Um, next one is sperm whales. This, the sperm whale selection is a, actually a really nice example of Cheville's dry wit that um, Michael mentioned. Oh, I guess it ent entered there. Um, it, he, it, it's By Cedar Caledon, sperm. the sperm whale is the largest of the odontocetes, and compared with some of its smaller relatives, is most disappointing to listen to. Told that we have never heard from this species 
anything more than what you are about to hear, you will agree that the sperm whale is a most monotonous conversation. <laughs> you will be listening to a small pod of seven, including one small calf in deep water off the continental shelf about 100 miles east of Delaware in August. I think actually Bill kind of undersold the sperm whales. They <laughs> since have found some pretty cool things about the different rhythmic patterns in sperm whale um, click patterns, which Bill Watkins coined the term for as codas. Um, but that's for a different talk. <laughs> so I'll move along here and just talk about how a lot of these pioneering recordings were then you know, turned into peer-reviewed scientific publications of which Watkins and Cheville had combined um, at least 350. I didn't actually get a complete count, but they were very prolific in their um, scientific publications. And this is just an example of a few of these descriptive publications. This one of the harp seal, a Weddell seal, the narwhal, minke whale, and this is the peel dolphin. And in addition to these descriptions of recorded sounds of marine mammals, um, Bill Watkins also made very important early contributions, um, and later, but the, pointing out the early ones right now, going chronologically, to the science of sound analysis. And so to quote from a tribute written by Doug Wartsock, Peter Tyak, and Carlton Ray in 2005, um, they said, Bill Watkins' experience in physics, electronics, and acoustics provided a firm and corrective hand that kept many natural historian marine mammalogists from making simple errors in the interpretation of underwater recordings. His 1967 analysis, which is the paper shown at the right there, taught bioacousticians how to interpret spectrograms, ushering in a whole new approach to analyzing sounds of all animals, not just marine mammals. And I'll point out that this paper is routinely cited still today in many um, marine mammal bioacoustics papers, or not even just marine mammals. You see this paper cited all the time. So it was really incredibly influential. Um, in addition to, um, well, the exploratory work that I uh, just dis discussed, um, Cheville and Watkins were among um, very few researchers granted security clearance to work with Navy SOSIS arrays, which are sound surveillance system arrays of hydrophones used to uh, monitor for submarines. And so here again, I'll uh, let Bill talk about this in his own words. Um, a lot of the, the things that the Navy calls noise, I was interested in because I knew that they did their animal, I didn't know what animal. But one of the benefits I got was to know where those sounds were occurring. And so when I could take a ship out, even though I couldn't, couldn't divulge where or how I got the information or why, it sure helped me to be able to know exactly what to do once I got out there. Okay. So one of their first tasks was to find the source of pervasive, loud, low-frequency, precisely timed sounds that the Navy was convinced were Russian in origin. Um, it took them several years to prove that it was actually an animal, namely a finback whale, as um, pictured here in this photo. And um, this is one of their early publications on these findings. And actually, I have a short sound clip that I had. I sped up four times. This is off of whale and porpoise voices. But um, on that recording, you actually can't hear the fin whales because they are too low for our hearing. So here, I just sped it up four times. and filtered out a little bit of the noise. It's just a short little clip. So these were these very loud pulses that, again, the Navy was convinced were Russian submarines. But um, anyway, these guys uh, managed to prove them wrong. And here's a little, another little anecdote. Well, we occupied the airspace above an installation off of, off of, you know, off of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. And uh, Bill Chaville circled forever while I sat in the shack on shore. And we both yelled simultaneously, Finbacks. <laughs> because he saw Finbacks and I saw, you know, I saw the signal on shore. 
and we were able to able to match that up. Okay. And I wanted to, while I was talking about SOSIS, I wanted to briefly mention another product of Bill Watkins' work with the Navy SOSIS arrays that you may have heard about in the popular media. Bill and his coworkers tracked uh, a, unique, a unique call over the course of 12 years on these SOSIS hydrophones in the North Pacific. And they felt that these sounds matched enough features of whale calls to convince them that it was a whale, but it was also distinct enough to be identifiable as a distinct individual and they were able to track its movement patterns across the North Pacific and speculated that maybe it was a hybrid of two species or possibly an animal with a malformed sound production system. I mean, again, they were just basing this on you know, recordings, so there's no observations of the animals. But this paper got picked up by the popular media, and um, the whale has been coined by the popular press as the loneliest whale in the world or the world's loneliest whale, whatever. And um, apparently it has a large following on various internet sites. So once I started Googling it, I was kind of shocked at how much there was out there, all sorts of message boards about what was, you know, was happening with this whale. And, um, and there's actually a documentary in the works right now about this whale where they're actually going to try to go out and find it and tag it. And um, so I assume you'll probably be hearing more about it. Um, but now on to the Cheville Walk-In Sound Archive, which is what we've been alluding to now um, throughout this, uh, this evening. The um, archive is, is a huge collection of recordings, not just those collected by Cheville and Watkins, but contributed by a whole bunch of other scientists. And they span seven decades, 76 species of marine mammals worldwide uh, geographically. And I should also mention that it's not even just marine mammal sounds. There's also ambient noise and um, ship noise and invertebrate noise and just all sorts of other things in this archive. The archive also includes 51 voucher recordings, which are the very first recordings of a given species. And right now, there are approximately 18,000 sound cuts and about half of the 2,000 tapes that have been actually digitized. Um, and so these recordings, digitized or not, are an extremely valuable resource for, at least right now, for, I'll just talk for a minute about scientific research, but um, for that um, aspect, they're very, very valuable as reference data sets for passive acoustic monitoring where people will put out recorders that are moored with no visual data, but then often, well, usually want to try to figure out what they're hearing and use those for seasonal studies, patterns of occurrence of different species. So the, this database is an extremely valuable source of, of um, verified recordings of particular species. And then another really valuable use scientifically is to look for changes in sounds over time, and those are, or not. Um, and just a couple of examples of recent studies that use data from the Cheville Watkins archive um, I'm showing here. I should point out that these particular researchers had connections to Hui, so we're able to access the recordings. It's, I'll talk in the next slide about our goal to make these publicly accessible so that anybody will be able to use them. But, um, so the study on the left compared, among other things, sounds produced by minke whales in different time periods, and one of these time periods was uh, 1964 recordings made by Watkins and Cheville. Um, and so in their study, they actually found relative stability in the parameters of these minke whale calls over time, whereas the study on the right used recordings made by Bill Cheville of North Atlantic right whales in 1956 and compared them to recordings in the same location in 2000. And this study actually found a very significant increase in the frequency range of the North Atlantic right whale calls over this 44-year period. And these authors speculated that this may be an adaptation to increased levels of anthropogen anthropogenic noise, like shipping noise, in the area. And so the whales may be in raising up their frequency levels to um, make their sounds more detectable against the noise. Okay, so. As I mentioned, we're working on, in the process of, um, with, with the New Bedford Whaling Museum on, on uh, making publicly available the digitized sounds on an open access website. Uh, so this is just right now focusing on the sounds that are already digitized, which is again is a, a quite large number. And that, um, to make them open, open access was Bill's goal, as I'll um, play for you this clip in a minute. But I'd um, also like to mention that um, 
the, uh, we're really excited that the New Bedford Willing Museum is acquiring all of the Shibyl Watkins tapes, notes, and other artifacts um, and from us, and that we're going to be working together to plan the next steps in terms of how these in incredible resources can be used educationally and in art outre outreach, research, um, and the possibilities are endless. So I will end now with another clip from Bill talking about this resource. Um, I would like to, as far as what, what I would like to see happen, I would like to have the accumulated knowledge and historical uh, understanding of what we have be translated into, into a marine sound archive that includes not only the animal sounds, but all of the various, uh, various geophysical sounds, uh, swallowfold sounds, uh, all the data that we've had over the years on multiple sound paths and that sort of thing would be very easy to bring in and include. And it would suddenly, suddenly translate a library that's wonderful for me into something that would be wonderful for everybody else. Okay, and so with that, I will just put up some acknowledgments of the many, many people and funding agencies over the years that contributed to the Shivel Watkins legacy. And um, I mentioned already that Joan Watkins is here, and I didn't know when I wrote this that um, John uh, Kendall was also in the audience. So anyway, uh, it was a very uh, large, large effort involving a lot of people. Um, and I'm sure I missed a lot in this list, but I just wanted to name a few, and I think with that, Michael and I can probably answer questions, if, if there are any. <laughs> All right. Do we have questions? Yes. So, I have a question about um, the noise, and, you know, at the risk of sounding ignorant, but my question, I'm just curious, like if I was underwater, would I hear these noises? Would my ears hear the noises, or does it have to be after the machine? Oh, no, it would, you could definitely hear the noises of most of these species, except, for example, fin, fin whales and blue whales, which are too low frequency for our hearings. And then, actually, there are a couple of other species that are too high, um, that like the harbor porpoise or some, some other species of dolphins and porpoises. But for the most part, if you were in the water near some vocalizing right whales and put your head in the water, would you would definitely hear it. Um, it depends. If you're in a boat, sometimes it comes right up through the hull. And sometimes you can hear them in air. I mean, you probably have like picked that up. Well, or, or, I mean, the sound will even transmit through the hull of some boats. And, uh, and you can sometimes hear them in air as well if they're vocalizing quite loudly near the surface. And right whales will also do a lot of really surface active behavior. And so I think you can hear some of those. But um, the dolphin, dol I mostly work with dolphins, and, and um, we can often hear them from above water when they're swimming right around us and whistling really loudly. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead, and then I'll, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, I, you said, uh, I don't remember what you said, but somebody said they make the sounds without vocal cords. Yes. How do they make well, for seats, the smaller tooth species, that is fairly well known. Um, that is through uh, vibrations in tissues of the nasal sacs, which are um, right below the blowhole. And so they actually seem to use one side to make whistles and one to make clicks, at least in the species that make both of those. Um, how the large whales make sounds, I don't know if Michael should take it from there, because I don't, I'm not sure if anybody knows, but if, maybe you do. Oh, do you need the mic? Oh, we can share it. It's okay, I'll, if I stand okay. close by? That's okay. fine. Well, last weekend I was in California at the American Cetacean Society biennial meeting, and. A lady called Joy Reidenberg there who works at Mount Sinai in New York and she's a specialist in the larynx of large whales and she periodically disappears with her Dodge Caravan with a blue whale larynx in the back. So, <laughs> anyway, I, I sort of, I used to send larynxes to Joy but I figured she'd figured it out by now and she sort of has. Um, she claims that it's in the larynx, there is this large vocal fold, and it's kind of like a sort of resonating tambourine type thing, I guess. 
and that's how she feels that they they make sense. It does seem, in terms of localizing, you can have these sort of spectrographic sort of imaging of where the sound's coming from in a baleen whale that it is in the larynx. She went on for two hours telling us all about this, and I guess I was convinced. I'm not sure. That. <laughs> yes. I think you're absolutely right, and the book I was mentioning um, certainly gets into that story, and, and essentially the principle of science being necessary but insufficient to make popular change and societal change was very well uh, articulated in that book, and I think you're absolutely right that Katie was essential to that whole process. And, if anybody hasn't read her book, Silent Thunder, about her discovery about infrasound communication elephants, it's a wonderful book to read in terms of a woman in science, an observer, and just an all around wonderful, wonderful read. And so, yeah, you know, I think the point I made earlier about um, Scott McVeigh, who worked with Roger Payne in, in when they published The Humpback Story, uh, Scott really was the sort of the mechanic, the engineer that figured out how to do the signal processing for that work. And so I think he needs some very strong recognition as well. Yes. You mentioned that it was quite late before they realized that echo location was being used by the whales. Did they have any idea of bats using echo location prior to that? Or was I can't remember the timeline. Do you know the bats? when bats, when did? They discover bats. I feel like it was around the same time. Yeah, and what was the guy's name? John. Um, uh, uh, it was Griffin. Don Griffin. Griffin. Don Griffin. Yeah. Um, I think the bats came first, um, but interestingly, um, some of the more sort of specific localization of how the the sonar was actually focusing and picking up on, on the target of the prey was, was done within the marine mammals quite recently, actually. So it's a sort of back and forth in terms of how that works. But they, they were in parallel, and there was definitely a sort of academic linkage to the point where I think Peter Tyak, who was a colleague working in the, with Watkins Villa, Layla's academic advisor as a PhD, was a PhD student of Don Griffin, so yes, is that right? That's right. At Stony yeah. Brook, was it? Uh, Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. So um, the spider's web includes bats in this one too, <laughs> and it, 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 it's actually a fascinating um, science of, of the legacy of intellectual relationships between the different laboratories and museums, and entities, institutions, and people as things trickle down. And you know, Layla definitely is is a, a legacy of, of the Cheville Watkins Tayac um, dynasty. Mm -hmm. I like to trace back my, my legacy to various other people who've cut up dead whales through the years. And there's, there's a couple of families of dead whale cutters in this country. Yeah. <laughs> One which actually started in Canada, the other which started in um, Olympia, Washington. But that's another story. <laughs> So I want to thank you all so much for coming, and thank you so much uh, to Leila and Michael for, uh, for their wonderful talk, and um, please chat with them afterwards. I have their contacts if you have further questions. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to leave you with a, a quick thought, which I find fascinating, again, from, from Bill Watkins' uh, transcript. So imagine when you're driving the car, and you get distracted, and you turn down the radio, because we're such a visual species. Um, squirrels freeze to hide from dogs from this visual world. But Bill talked about, uh, I call him Bill, although I didn't get to meet him personally, but I hope that's okay, um, uh, that when whales try to hide, they go silent. You can't have a private conversation because they speak across oceans um, within a community. So you can't whisper to your friend. Everyone can hear what you're saying. 
So it's a very interesting, there's so many possibilities of how we can engage this material. And I just love the sort of the curiosity that Michael was talking about earlier. Um, the more I learn about this collection, the more connections we can make. It's just feeding the sort of wonderful um, curiosity that we all carry. So I just want to thank you again so much for the privilege of being stewards of this fantastic collection. And thank you so much for coming tonight. And uh, there'll be much more to follow in the next year or two as we develop um, our interpretation of this material. So thank you very much. Thank you.